Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Shadar Shands. I am the current uh, New Practitioner Network co-chair for the National Pharmaceutical Association. And Vanessa. You're muted. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Vanessa Ejafor, and I am the New Practitioner Network co-chair for NAFA. And today we will be discussing how to fix your finances. Um, there's going to be different topics that would be touched upon by Mr. Harrison. Um, and actually, let me just leave it to him to introduce himself. <laughs> Can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> all right, well, it's nice to meet all you guys virtually. Um, I, I understand that there is a lot of Zoom fatigue in these times. So I'll try to keep it as lighthearted as um, 50,000 foot view as we can and, and definitely try to make sure that I hit the objective. So I, I appreciate you guys having me. I'm always appreciative when somebody uh, asks me to share what information I can, I can share. So I want to make sure that this evening, what we do, you know, I, I think the term fix your finances is very interesting because most of you, if I understand how this group is formed, you may feel like your finances are in a place where they need fixing, but in actuality, you haven't yet been out long enough to really mess them up. It may feel like they're messed up, but I'm really gonna try to make sure that I teach you some of the things that I think would be helpful for someone who's just coming out, someone within five years of coming out, and those foundational principles that I think are important financially. So I'm gonna to try to talk for a little bit, we'll leave time for question and answer at the end. But today, what I wanna start with, instead of fix your finances, is in a more positive note, you know, you're making money, now what, right? And that's really the feeling of most young professionals. It just so happens that in your profession, you feel that more intensely because you're getting thrown a larger amount of money in some cases, getting thrown that after residency, but you also have a larger amount of debt. So you've worked all these years, you've been studying, you've had delayed gratification while all your friends that you graduated with are out on vacation, and now you get that money, but you're trying to figure out, okay, I got this money, and there are six different things that I have to attend to financially, and how do I know how to prioritize these things when it comes to my budget? So that's what we're going to talk about. And when it comes to that scenario, there are, in my mind, tiers of knowledge. And in many cases, you see people flip this pyramid that you see on its head. And when they get out and they say, okay, now I'm making money, I wanna figure out how to make that money grow, they actually start with this thing at the top, right? They start with investing and they try to figure out, oh, I have friends who are doing stock options. I have friends who are buying Tesla, GameStop. I have friends who are making all this money and I wanted to try to jump head first into that without really having an idea of these foundational items. So when it comes down to these foundational items, what you see here got a little skewed with the PowerPoint is you see student loan knowledge, emergency savings and credit utilization. Now that might sound odd for me to say those are the foundational items when it comes to finances, because that's probably not what you've heard in the past. You've probably heard uh, budgeting. You've probably heard, you know, save more than you spend. All of those things are very accurate. But when it comes to a new professional in your situation, what I want to show you are the foundational knowledge tools that I think you build upon that impact everything else. So we're going to go from this from the bottom up so that you have an understanding of how each of these things on the bottom layer of the pyramid impact the other. Now, most people who are in your scenario, and uh, you don't have to unmute, you don't have to go on video, but if you could give me a thumbs up or a yes, or a, I hear you, most people in your situation, the biggest financial thing they have, either asset or debt, when they graduate from pharmacy school is student loan. Right? Is that accurate? Is there any person, I'm not saying all of you, but is there a person or two that could at least give me a, yes, I understand, facts. Okay, I see one person, for sure. Yes, sigh, yes. Facts. So, okay, thank you. All right, so these are the things that you worry about the most, not just in terms of how to pay them off, but also in terms of, is this gonna keep me from being able to buy a home? 
Is this going to keep me from being able to have that wedding of my dreams? What if I want to open my own business or do investment property? How are these student loans going to impact all these other areas of the pie? So if you understand student loans, both private and federal, especially federal, you'll see that there are some common trends, there are some themes, and there are some tools that you can use that benefit you with the student loans that actually force you to contribute to those other areas of your finance. We're going to start with the private student loans. I know that's probably a smaller element of the people who are watching, but it's important still. So what I think the important thing is with student loans, and hear me out, and this is another thing, I'm going to ask you guys to be in the chat just so I can force you to pay attention a little bit. I want you to tell me if you understand the difference between what I say and what people might hear. Here's what I'm going to say. With student loans, private and federal, for a new professional who's earning good money while also trying to pay off debt, I think that the most important thing is to negotiate the lowest required payment possible. Now, what I didn't say is to make the lowest payment possible. I said, I think one of the most important things is to negotiate the lowest required payment possible. Can I get anybody in the chat who understands the difference? A yes or explain it a little more. Yes, I pay extra. Yes. All right. Now, here's why that's so important. We're going to build upon this knowledge when it comes to employee benefits, when it comes to retirement, when it comes to how they look at home ownership for people who have student loans. And what you'll find in many cases is that if you have the lowest required payment possible, it frees up so many areas of your finances, whether it be having the flexibility to save more, whether it be you putting money towards that retirement or putting money towards a down payment. And when you have that low required payment, it also makes you look more appealing to a lender when you need those things that we're talking about when it comes to home ownership or business ownership. So first, we're going to start with private student loans, and we're going to talk about how you can negotiate that low payment, because many of you probably think that when it comes to private student loans, the rate that you get initially is the rate that you have to have forever. That's actually not the case. When it comes to private student loans, the way that they factor in your interest rate is a combination of these factors, and most lenders will not tell you exactly the combination, but this is how they look at it. They look at your credit score. And not just your credit score, many private loans will require you to have a cosign. If you're interested in cosigning for someone else's loan, please save that question to the end. But just understand that when you have a private student loan, you are the, uh, the person who's receiving the loan, but they also might require you to have a second person on that loan who's a co-guarantor. And what they do is they look at both of your credit scores and based on the strength of each person on the loan, that factors into the interest rate that you receive. They also look not just at your income, but the dependability of your income. And I'll give you an example of the difference. Um, I work for myself. I work off of fees and commissions and uh, all different types of things. So I may earn a good income, but I don't know exactly to the dollar what my income will be from year to year. Now, let's say that I make you know, a certain amount of money more than a pharmacist, maybe 10 or 15% more. But that pharmacist knows every single year what their paycheck is going to be every two weeks. Well, a lender is going to look more favorably upon that person's application than mine because their income is more dependable and consistent. And then also economic benchmarks. And all of these things work together to help determine the interest rate that a private lender gives to you on a private student loan. So when it comes to making sure you have the lowest student loan payment, a lot of it is figuring out the interest rate that you receive and how long you plan to pay it back. And if you're trying to get a lower payment, it really comes down to assessing whether or not there are opportunities to refinance. And here is how you can look and see if they have those opportunities. One of, if there is a positive thing about private student loans, one of those positive things is that when you try to get an interest rate on a private student loan, you can actually get a good idea of what you might receive before you apply by doing what's called a soft credit pool. We're going to get into credit a little further in a second, but needless to say, when it comes to checking a rate, I go to SoFi or I go to Common Bond or I go to Lower Road and I'm trying to figure out if the rate that they're offering is better than the rate that I have currently, I can actually within two minutes fill out an application, give them my social security number, 
and they're going to do what's called a soft pull of my credit. Now, the great thing is when people do a hard pull of your credit, it impacts your credit score. It makes it go down, albeit temporarily. But with a soft credit pull, there is no impact on your credit score. And what that means is when you're trying to figure out the best place for your private student loans, you can actually do an application with 15 or 16 or 20 different private lenders and get an introductory rate that you can use to compare with the other applications that you've filled out. And it's not until you do the full application that they really check your credit. So if you're trying to figure out where I can get the best rate, you don't have to worry about, well, I applied five different places and now my credit score has been decimated. You can actually check with all of those companies, get an introductory rate, and where you see the lowest rate, decide whether or not you want to go through with a full application. That's one way that you can assess your refinancing opportunities frequently. Another reason that you want to consider doing this is when you compare refinancing a private student loan to, say, purchasing a home, it's very different. I don't know if anybody on this call has purchased a home in the past, but when you purchase a home, even when you purchase a car, there are application fees to doing so. With a home, it's called closing costs. With a car loan, it's origination fees. But essentially, when you apply, it costs you money to apply. So people don't go and just refinance their house two and three times a year because every time that they do it, it costs them money. But thankfully, with private student loans, there are no fees to apply. So we already covered that you don't have to worry about them damaging your score when you see what your rate might be. But then when it comes time to actually do the full application, it doesn't cost you any money to do that as well. So when I look and I have people who have private student loans and they're trying to figure out how to lower their payment or lower their interest rate, I can tell them you can actually do this as frequently as is financially beneficial to you and it will have no negative impact on the amount you owe or the length of repayment if you handle it properly. So this is, if you have private student loans, one of the keys to making sure you're always in the best scenario. You want to not just assume that you got the lowest rate possible and next year it's too soon to refinance or six months from now it's time it's too early to refinance. You can say, I'm going to check this two or three times a year to make sure I always have the best rate for me. And if it makes sense to move, you can move without damaging your finances. These are private student loans, but since that's the smaller portion, we're going to spend the larger time tonight on federal student loans, because I would imagine this is what most of you have. So again, in the chat, anybody have federal student loans here? I just want to make sure two or three people are paying attention. Yep. Okay. Unfortunately. Yes, sir. All right. Now, if you could tell me as you've graduated, as you've started your career, I'll keep talking, but give me an idea of what the most confusing thing to you about federal student loan repayment is. I'll talk as you type and I'll make sure that we address it. So the most confusing thing about federal student loans. Who is Great Lakes? Okay. Why they must exist. Why Biden hasn't erased it yet. That, okay. All right. So what I would say, and I, I will address, I'll leave the Biden thing till the end, but I will address it if you stick around. That's a promise. Um, what I would say about federal student loans in terms of my interactions with clients is, okay, the balance between paying loans and investing. That's a great question. It's almost as if you teed this up for me. How do you find the balance between paying them off and investing? To me, for someone who owes a significant amount of federal student loan debt, the difference in finding the balance between saving and investing, saving and paying down debt, paying down debt and purchasing that big thing that you've been waiting to purchase is understanding something called income-driven plans. Now, you guys have heard this terminology, hopefully. You've heard pay as you earn, you've heard revised pay as you earn, you've heard income-based repayment, you've heard all of those different things, but there are some key principles as to what makes an income-driven plan an income-driven plan. So let's first talk about like all those terms, revised pay as you earn, income-based repayment, pay as you earn, all of those are different forms of income-driven plans. 
So think of income driven plans as like this big overarching umbrella. And within that umbrella, you have all of these different forms of income driven plans. That makes sense? So within that umbrella, all of these loans share the same principles. Let's talk about what those principles are. So you can use the rules that they use against them to make sure you have a low payment. The first thing about these plans is that the payment that you make has literally no connection at all to your student loan balance. And I couldn't mean that more literally. Let's say that um, I'm on a plan called revised pay as you earn, which is one of the income driven plans. And maybe I owe $10,000 in student loans. And Vanessa, I'm gonna pick on you. Maybe you're also on revised pay as you earn, but you have a million dollars in student loans. But even though we have such wildly different amounts of student loans, we have the same what's called discretionary income. The payment under these plans is based on that discretionary income. So even though she owes a million and I owe 10,000, the payment under these plans that we make is gonna be the exact same. It's not connected to the loan balance. It's always connected to a percentage of this discretionary income. So if you can learn how to lower your discretionary income, you will actually lower your required student loan payment. Payment has no connection to your loan balance. It's always based on a percentage of discretionary income. The next principle about these plans is that you pay on them for 20 to 25 years, depending on your plan, and any remaining balances are forgiven. Now, there's a caveat to that forgiveness, so let's talk about it. Let's say in the example that I gave, uh, Vanessa owes the million dollars, and under these plans, based on her discretionary income, she's paying 50 bucks a month. I think it's pretty clear that if they owe a million dollars in student loans, they're paying $50 on student loans, after 20 years, you're still gonna have a balance. Would you say that's fair? Yes, all right, so $50, 20 years towards a million dollars, you're still gonna have a balance. In this scenario, those remaining funds would be forgiven, but taxes would be owed on the forgiveness one time. See, a lot of people asking about this, if at the end of this period of time, there's money left over, the Department of Education will forgive that loan, but it's going to look like whatever was forgiven was actually income in the year it was forgiven. An example would be uh, if $50,000 was forgiven and in that same year I earned $100,000, I would have to pay taxes on $150,000 worth of income. What I actually earned plus the amount that was forgiven, one time only. So that's the next principle. And they ask you to tell them what you earn every single year so that they can recalculate your payment. So let's talk about how we can use these rules of income-driven plans to your benefit. I talked about these payments being based off of a percentage of something called your discretionary income. Discretionary income is not your actual income. We talked about an example of making $100,000. Your discretionary income is going to be less than what you actually earn. Because your loan servicer, like Great Lakes, is going to use this formula on the bottom. They're going to use a formula that's called your adjusted gross income minus one and a half times something called the federal poverty level. Now, I can spend an hour just on this formula, but for the purposes of this evening, what we're going to do is we're going to basically just say that all you need to understand is that adjusted gross income is a number that's listed on your tax return. It's not what you actually earn. And you also need to know that you can make certain steps that actually force you to save for yourself and incentivize you to do things like become an entrepreneur while reducing your student loan payment. And I'll show you how. The key is to lowering this adjusted gross income. You can see in this formula, if you lower your adjusted gross income, you will lower your discretionary income. So how do we do that? How do we lower our adjusted gross income? Well, the first thing is you need to understand how they get to your adjusted gross income. And here's how. When you file your taxes, at the top of your tax return, the form called a 1040, there's all these things that you made throughout the year and you total those things up and that's called your, your total income. Literally just, if I had a rental property, if I got a bonus, uh, whatever my salary was, all those things total up and those are your total income. 
But after you get your total income, the IRS is going to subtract a number of things called above the line tax deductions or pre-tax deductions. And after they subtract those items, you're left with a number called your adjusted gross income. So if you can find a way to lower this as much as possible, it lowers your student loan payment. So what are some of these things? Well, the first, we'll talk about the difference between a pre-tax retirement contribution and a post-tax retirement contribution. But for now, understand that the more you put into your retirement account, the lower your adjusted gross income will drop. Also, if you are self-employed, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an independent contractor, one of the negative parts of that is people who are not entrepreneurs, they have employment taxes and their employer is actually responsible for paying half of the employment taxes. But when you work for yourself, you have to pay for all of it. But thankfully, when it comes to adjusted gross income, they will take half of what you paid really to incentivize you to still be in business for yourself and they'll allow you to use that to reduce your adjusted gross income. And then lastly, for what we're going to discuss tonight, things like health savings accounts, flex spending accounts, dependent care flex spending accounts. These are probably employee benefits that you've seen at your job, may not have understood how they work. We're going to cover how they work, but understand that if you put money into these things, it also lowers your adjusted gross income. Let's go through an example of how powerful that reduction can be and how it actually incentivizes you to save for your own future. Let's look at an example of Jane Doe. Jane Doe is the head of a family of three. Uh, she and her husband or she and her wife, they have a total salary of $200,000. That's their total income. They have a discretionary income of $168,005. Now, what did I just do here? Remember, let's go back a little bit. Your discretionary income is what they're going to use to calculate your loan payment. The way they get that is they take your adjusted gross income and they subtract 150% of the federal poverty level. The person in this example is going to have to pay 10% of whatever this formula says as a student loan payment for the year. So in this example, we took 200000 we subtracted one and a half times the federal poverty level for a family of three, and it left a discretionary income of $168,005. They pay 10% of that per year. So they're going to pay an annual payment of $16,800, and that leads to a loan payment of $1,400 a month. So in this scenario, this person didn't do anything to help lower their adjusted gross income. They are not going to put money in a retirement account. They're not working for themselves. They're not using it for a health savings account. They're just saying, here's what I made, subtract what you can subtract in terms of the federal poverty level, and I'm gonna pay 10% of that. But let's go and see what happens if they use some of these contributions to lower their adjusted gross income. Let's say that they make that $200,000 in between she and her spouse, they contribute $19,000 to retirement accounts. And maybe they put $7,000 in health savings accounts. Now, instead of them having $200,000 that's used in that calculation, we've lowered it to $174,000. You put that in, it lowers their discretionary income, and the discretionary income leads to a lower payment. So by them putting money into their own retirement, by them putting money aside for their own health expenses, they lower their student loan payment by over $200 a month. This is how you use their rules to help your own finances. The more you save for yourself, the lower this payment will be. The lower this payment is, the easier it makes it for a lender to give you loans to go further your finances even more. So this is an example of how you can use federal student loan rules to incentivize you to build your own wealth. But let's also talk about the timing of this because the timing of it is incredible in terms of the fact that remember this adjusted gross income is found on your tax return. The only way that your their IRS or the, the student loan servicer can access your tax return is that if they go to the one that you filed last year, right? We're in 2021, so you don't have a 2021 tax return yet. You have to wait until the end of the year. 
So if I'm trying to show my loan service or my tax return this year, the only one they have access to is 2020. And I get a yes if there's anybody that understands that. Loan servicer bases your payment off of a number on your tax return. They can only access the one from the previous year. Anybody else? All right, so we get the yes. So let's talk about how that previous year's tax return can help me. Again, separate answer in the chat. Is it fair to say that in the first two to three years as a pharmacist, each year your income goes up pretty significantly, or at least in those first two years? Is that accurate? Come out of residency, see a nodding head, give me yes. All right, so let's go. Sure, Ella, thank you, Eden. All right, so let's go and let's see how this timing can work to your benefit. We're going to look at this formula again. Adjusted gross income from the previous year minus 150% of the federal poverty line. And now let's look at a person who is going into their residency. So they start their residency in July or August, but they also graduated this year. So the salary that they're going to make from their residency year is 55,000. But when they apply for their student loan payment, the only tax return their lender has is from the previous year when they didn't make any income at all because they were in their fourth year. So their adjusted gross income from 2020 is $0. And when you plug $0 into that formula, it's going to technically lead to a negative discretionary income. But for your loan servicers purposes, let's just say that it's $0. 10% of $0 is what? $0. Somebody, I'm, I, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna force you guys to, to pay attention. All right, so let's see, this person now, in addition to the fact that they're gonna have a $0 payment for 12 months, they also had a six month grace period in which they didn't have to make payments. So technically they're going to have 18 months where they made no payment at all. But let's go and see what happens after that 18 months. So they had 18 months where they didn't have to pay anything at all. That allowed them to save. That allowed them to pay down consumer debt. But now 18 months later, they're sitting there and they're saying, well, now residency is over. I'm making good money now. I'm going to have to really pay the piper. But let's see what happens. Now this person is making $120,000. But their last year's tax return doesn't show $120,000 it doesn't even show the 55,000 that they made in residency. Why is that the case? It's because they only worked half of the year. So their tax return says 27,500 because they were in school for the first half of the year. And when you plug this in, you get a discretionary income for the year of $8,180. They're gonna pay 10% of that for the year, which means they pay $818 for the year, $68.17 for the month. Make sense? So now, 18 months of no payment, 12 months of $68, we are 30 months post-graduation before we get to the point where this person makes a payment that they would think they would be making early in their career. Now, this is the third year. Third year, $125,000 salary, 2020 adjusted gross income. Again, you think it's 120,000, that's what they made the previous year. But in the first part of that year, it was the end of their residency. So it only shows 87,500. You plug that into the formula and this person, this is no joke, this is a significant payment. But the point is you will probably, if you manage this appropriately, be in your fourth or fifth year before you are actually going to make a payment that is commensurate with what your pay is at that time. And I see you saying you wish you knew this two years out, but understand this. If you understand the rules about the retirement planning, about the health savings accounts, about all these things, you can still use this. You can still say, the more I put into my own coffers, the lower my student loan payment will be. This is how you use this to launch into the next part of our discussion. Understanding the student loans, I'm keeping my eye on the time, builds into these other areas, like what is a true emergency fund? So let's see what a true emergency fund is. To me, there's a big difference and some of this is personal preference. I always try to let you know when I have a bias and I'm very biased as to how much people should keep in a savings account or in pure cash. 
So I like to, instead of talking about emergency funds, talk about having access to funds. And I'll explain the difference. When I'm meeting with clients and they're asking me how much should I have in cash, I always ask them how much money, you know, depending on the audience, I might say like, if you need to get low, which to me is I need money in 24 hours. Like, I don't need to tell you why, I need money in 24 hours. How much do you need? And in most cases, it's far less than people associate with having an emergency fund. Because if you think about it, if you, let's say that um, something happens to your home, well, you have homeowner's insurance. Let's say something happens to your car, well, you have auto insurance. Let's say something happens to your health, you have health insurance. If you unfortunately were to pass, you likely have life insurance. There's all these different things that you have at your disposal that are unlikely to put you in a scenario where you actually need a significant amount of money within 24 hours. But for most people, I do think it's helpful to keep at least three months expenses in pure, boring old cash in a savings account. But beyond then, you see people who glorify saying, oh, I got a year's worth of expenses in the bank. And my question is why? Like what type of emergency are you expecting to happen where you would need access to a year's worth of expenses in 24 hours? When in actuality, if I told you, hey, it's Monday, if you need a certain amount of money, I can have it to you by Friday. In many cases, that would be sufficient. You're not gonna have an emergency that requires more urgency than that. So what you can do with that increase, with that money from three months expenses to six months expenses, or however much you choose, is you can put it in a different account. And you can even consider investing it, whether you want to invest it conservatively or moderately or aggressively. But the point is, giving it at least the opportunity to have some growth will benefit you far more than having that money just sitting in cash. Let's look at an example. Most places, and I wish I could guarantee this every single year, I wish it was like some ingenuity on my part that could lead to guaranteed investment returns. I can't guarantee those returns. But if you looked at most investments last year, they were probably up 15%. So let's say that you're one of those people who glorifies having money in pure savings, and maybe you had $30,000 more in savings than you really needed to or 50,000, let's go with 50,000 so the math is easier for me. You have 50,000 more in cash than you needed to, and that is earning no rate of return. Well, if you had that money invested, that's the difference between you earning really no money versus $7,500 worth of growth by you understanding that you don't have to have every single dollar that you need in pure cash. You wanna have enough to meet your base expenses for a certain period of time, but after that, you want to build another layer of investments other than your retirement account that gives you the ability to have the potential to earn a rate of return. And then if you go even beyond six months expenses, then you can start to be the type of person who builds up for things like project funds, whether it be home ownership or business ownership or just general investments. You want to get in the habit of prioritizing your emergency fund but also understanding where is the stopping point at which you won't put any more money in that account. For me, I have a very set amount that I plan to keep in savings at any given time. And once I have that amount, any additional money that I might save, I never put it in my savings account because there's no opportunity for return there. I take my increase and I put it in a separate account and I still have access to that account. It just takes a little longer than 24 hours. Now let's look at, and we're coming to the last two phases, kind of want to make sure we leave at least 10 minutes for questions. This is, what's the best way to put this? Um, well, first, as I think of the best way to put this, is anybody tracking with me so far? With inflation, keeping too much in savings is actually losing you money. All right, so is everybody tracking with me? You guys have, have time for two more quick sections? Absolutely, all right. If I get one more, I will continue. All right, all right, all right, cool. I always wanna make sure we don't throw too much. Uh, so let's keep going. Um, to me, when I think of credit, I think that credit scores are incredibly misunderstood. And I wanna make sure you have an understanding of everything that goes into a credit score. I also want you to be realistic about the things that will 
for lack of a better term, bulletproof your credit score. Like there are some parts of your credit score that just from a statistical perspective are not as relevant as others. And you want to pay attention to them. But if you look at the percentages of what makes up a credit score, realistically, like let's say that you have the worst uh, measure of credit inquiries and credit mix available, which we'll cover what these things are. Those are only 20% of your score. So if the other areas of your credit are fine, these two areas are just not going to have much of an impact. They are not weighted heavily enough to make your score move either way at the end of the spectrum, higher or lower. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about are the two key areas, and we're gonna cover specifically the one that I think is the most confusing. So let's go over all the areas first. Payment history is 35% of your score. I don't care what anybody has told you about like tricks to lower, increase your score, turn your score around quickly. Flat, like just the math says that the best way to keep and maintain a strong credit score is to just pay your bills on time. It's the biggest component of your score. Now, credit utilization, which is the one we're gonna cover in more detail tonight, is 30% of your score. So these two alone are 65% of your score. If you can master these two, you leave yourself so much room for error in the other three that you can actually build yourself to a point where it just becomes actually pretty difficult to lower your credit score. Like I've, over the course of time, fortunately, by having an understanding of how these things work, it would actually be pretty difficult for my credit score to go down just because of how strong these highest two categories are once you have a grasp of it. Age of your accounts, we're gonna come back to what credit utilization means, but age of your accounts is 15% of your score. What this means is that the older your credit is, the better. Every time you sign up for a line of credit is given a birthday. So if you signed up today, it's the 28th. You signed up for an account today on your credit, there's gonna be an account that says open June 28th, 2021. And the older the average age of your accounts, the better it reflects on your score. Now, one area that you want to make sure that you might have heard is, oh, when you pay off a credit card, cancel the card. That's actually a terrible idea. Because if you think about it, I said the older your age, the better. If you opened an account five years ago, even if you were just miserable with paying off that card for five years, but you finally got into the point where it's paid off, well, if you cancel it, it wipes away that five years worth of history. So if you don't want to use it, you'd be better off cutting it up, but don't cancel it. You never want to cancel a credit card. Credit inquiries is 10%, which just means that you don't want people checking your credit for no reason. The more people that are checking your credit, the worse off it will be for this part of your score. And then credit mix is 10%. I don't spend a lot of time there. It basically just means that the more diverse the types of credit you have on your uh, report, the better it is, but you don't want to go adding credit just to try to diversify your credit. So I don't spend a lot of time there. We're gonna focus on credit utilization. Credit utilization, here's what it means. It is a measure that shows your credit bureau, it shows lenders, it shows the industry in terms of who put your credit score together, how much of your available revolving credit that you've borrowed at a given point in time. And there's a reason that I've capitalized those areas. Revolving credit, what does that mean? Revolving credit means it's a type of credit that technically never expires and doesn't have a definitive payoff date. Think of something like a personal line of credit or a credit card. You could technically owe on a credit card until you die if you only make the, the minimum payments. It revolves. There's no definitive payoff date and there's no just line in the sand that says it has to be paid off within this time. Installment debt is different. Installment debt is like a home loan or a car loan or a student loan. And installment debt does not factor into credit utilization at all. So when it comes to talking about like, oh, if I'm looking at my credit utilization, what is my, my student loan going to do to that? It has no impact. What we're talking about are things like credit cards. So what they want to see is if you have three or four credit cards, how much could you borrow on those cards? Maybe it's 10,000, 20,000. And then they want to know when we check, how much have you borrowed at that time? 
If you borrow 10% of your available credit, 20% of your available credit, 30% of your available credit, and the lower your utilization ratio, the lower the percentage of your available credit that you've borrowed when they check your score, the better it will reflect. Let's look at how you can make sure that is as low as possible. Um, you have a lot of people who think you shouldn't use credit cards. I would say that it's up to you to determine whether or not you're responsible enough to use credit cards. And if you are not, then don't use them. Um, so I see a question that says less than 10% of your credit line. Basically, how much of your credit should you use? Here's what I'll say, and this is kind of a trick of the, the trade. I don't want to mispronounce your name. I hate when people mispronounce my name, so, but I see your comment. Um, you can borrow up to 100% of your credit line as long as you pay it off before they check it. And let's talk about what I mean by that. Now, you have probably heard that 30% is the amount that you need to stay under, right? Like if I have a certain amount of available credit, I need to make sure that when they check my score, I owe less than 30%. And that is accurate in the sense that if you owe more than 30%, it hurts your score. But I would actually say the lower your utilization ratio, the better. They've actually done studies that show that people who have perfect credit on average have a utilization ratio below 10%. That doesn't mean that they only borrow 10% on their card. It means that they know when to pay it off so that when people check their score, it doesn't show as high a balance. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Let's look at an example. I don't know if you guys, all right. Can you guys see this okay? Thumbs up. Yes, all right. So this is a sample credit card statement. Just so you guys, in case you've never seen how this actually works in linear format, let's say that you have a credit card and when you have a credit card, they are going to look at what you borrow and spend in a 30-day increment. You have a month-long credit card statement. And typically, it goes from mid-month to mid-month. So we're going to assume in this example that this person has a credit card that st start date is at January 15th. And it goes until February 14th. So basically, they are having every purchase that they make throughout this period monitored. So we're going to assume that they spent $1,000 throughout this 30-day period. So at the end of this statement period on February 14th, they get a bill that says, hey, you spent $1,000 on your card, but then they're gonna say, we're gonna give you until March 10th to pay it off. And as long as you pay it off by March 10th, we're not gonna charge you any interest on what you borrowed. So what most people who are trying to manage their credit well do is they get this bill for $1,000 and they say, okay, well, as long as I pay it off by March 10th, I'm not going to pay any interest, which is true. But they also assume that if they pay it off in full, they're going to have a 0% a utilization ratio. And that's false. And here's why. Even though they pay it off in full by March 10th, when it comes to what credit bureaus report in terms of your utilization ratio, they report what you owe at the end of the statement period. So if, for example, this card had a limit of $2,000, and at the end of the statement period, you have a $1,000 balance, even if you paid it off in full by the end of the period, you're going to have a 50% utilization ratio on this card, and that's way too high. Now, the problem with this is your credit card issuer knows that, and they set up their payment alerts so that they alert you of when your payment is due by this payment date, when in actuality, if you would set a timer or a calendar reminder for yourself to pay off this bill on February 13th, then even though you borrowed $1,000 through this period, when it comes time to report, you'd have a $0 balance and you'd have a 0% utilization ratio. <laughs> immediately pays off my weekend shopping spree. This is how, I see the cashback card question. I'm gonna save that to the end if you stick around. But this is how, when I talk about foundational knowledge, does the same thing apply to secured credit cards? Yes, um, it's all based off of end of the period, what did I borrow when they report my statement balance? These are the types of things where I talked about that pyramid of foundational knowledge. You're starting to see how lowering your student loan payment our understanding when they check your credit. We're building ourselves to a point where we have a good emergency fund, we have a low student loan payment, 
and we have low consumer debt. Are we starting to see why this could be helpful as we build towards the more complex things like investing? All right, let's finish up with home ownership and employee benefits. We're gonna do this in five minutes. Um, all right, so home ownership. We're not gonna shortchange, I'm just gonna tell you um, the broad strokes, not to, to summarize too quickly, but just so you have an idea of, we're not gonna get into details of how much you should purchase, but this is how you will purchase. We're now in a position where we should be pretty well balanced financially. And we can start to say, hey, well now I wanna see how much home I can afford. There's gonna be two elements that they use to determine your interest rate and how much you can borrow. The credit score that we just worked to improve is what they're gonna to use to determine your interest rate. That's what they're gonna to use to determine whether you pay 4% or 3% or 2.75%. The higher your score, the lower your interest rate. But your debt to income ratio determines how much you can borrow. The debt to income ratio is really important. We're gonna come back to this, but here's what debt to income ratio means. Debt to income ratio is a ratio that expresses how much of your monthly income is swallowed up by your monthly debt payments. The example that I give is, let's say that you have a $5,000 monthly income, but your debt payments are $3,000, you have a 60% debt to income ratio. That is too high to be approved for a home loan. So the lower you can get your debt to income ratio, the better it will reflect on your application. And guess what factors very heavily into your debt to income ratio? Your student loan payments. So remember the difference between having a low required payment and a low payment that you make, those are two completely different things. I don't care what you pay as long as you're comfortable with it. What I do care about is finding a way for it to show up as the lowest payment possible when they do things like go through your application for a home loan. And the income driven plans that we discussed are really helpful with this because when you're on an income driven plan, they will allow you to use whatever you're paying in this calculation, regardless of what you owe. So in this example where Vanessa owed a million dollars, but she's only paying $50 on her student loans, when they calculate that debt to income ratio, it's only gonna show 50 bucks. But if you're not on an income driven plan, some lenders will use 1% of your loan balance as your monthly payment instead. So if you owe $200,000 in student loans, but you're not on an income-driven plan, they're gonna take 1% of that, $2,000 a month, and insert that into your debt to income ratio, and it will put you in a position where it's too high to qualify for a home loan. But when you get there, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide. If you can negotiate that low payment, negotiate that low debt to income ratio, it will give you an idea of how to position yourself to make sure that you can save up for a down payment and save up for closing costs. There are two different things. I promise you we'll be out of here in five minutes. So what I'll say is there's gonna be a down payment that you have to deal with, which is typically three and a half to 20% of the purchase amount. There's also gonna be closing costs. We talked about the fact that student loans don't have a cost to apply but homes do have a cost to apply. And those are one to 2% of the loan amount. So I gave an example here, we have a $500,000 home. We're gonna assume that you make a 10% down payment with 1% closing cost. Remember that the down payment is based on the purchase amount. So it's 10% of the $500,000, which is $50,000. But the 1% closing costs are based on the loan amount. So if we put down 50,000, we only borrowed 450. So our closing cost will be 1% of the 450 that we borrowed. So you can kind of use this template if you're looking at a home that's 350,000 or 400,000 or 275,000, and you can start to see, okay, well, maybe I can't do the 10% down payment, but I might be able to do the three and a half percent down payment to figure out how you can qualify for things like that. And then lastly, retirement and employee benefits. The reason that I don't spend a lot of time on this is because to me, these are some things that take care of themselves if you have understood those other foundational items. But I did promise you we would talk about pre-tax versus post-tax benefits. Pre-tax benefits, all you need to know 
is that pre-tax benefits are things that you can pay for from an employee benefit perspective that are taken out of your paycheck before taxes are assessed against your paycheck. And they also help lower your adjusted gross income. They help reduce the amount of income on which you will pay taxes. The example that I gave is if you have a $100,000 salary and you subtract $5,000 in pre-tax contributions, then you're only going to pay taxes on $95,000 of income. It essentially erases that $5,000 when it comes time to pay the IRS. Now, post-tax benefits, which would be something like a Roth retirement account, they don't have any upfront tax benefits. And they can be really useful, but as long as you have federal student loans and you're paying them back on an income-driven plan, you want to prioritize your pre-tax benefits because pre-tax benefits help lower your adjusted gross income and they help lower your discretionary income. The lower your discretionary income, the lower your student loan pay. So health savings accounts and retirement accounts. This is the last slide, I'm pretty sure. Yep, this is the last slide. Health savings accounts are, to me, one of the most unique financial tools that you will find. A health savings account is an account that lowers your taxes, it lowers your health insurance premiums. It gives you a secondary retirement source. It's pretty incredible. And here's how it works. A health savings account is an account where the health insurance company basically says, if you will take on the responsibility of saving for your own medical expenses, we will in turn lower how much you have to pay us on a monthly basis. So they do that by saying, in order to have a health savings account, you have to sign up for a high deductible health plan. So that means if you go to the doctor, you're going to have to pay more for the doctor than you've ever had to pay before, before they chip in. Now that sounds like a negative, but here's the benefit that you can exchange for that. The first benefit is that the money that you put in is pre-tax, meaning that it lowers your taxable income, lowers your student loan payment, and forces you to pay less in taxes. But you also can invest that money. If you don't use all of the money in your health savings account, then it rolls over from year to year to year. And the money that rolls over is invested. And not only do you not pay taxes when you put the money in, you also don't pay taxes on it when you take it out, right? So as it grows, as long as you use it for a health-related expense, you don't pay money on you take it in, you don't pay money as it grows, you don't pay taxes when you take it out, as long as it's a health-related expense. But if you're looking and you're saying, well, yeah, I don't want to get to 65 years old. I have $100,000 in a health savings account, and it's not going to cost me that much for health-related expenses. The positive is, after the age of 65, you can use it for whatever you want to. It's no longer limited to just, just health expenses. Now, if you use it for an expense that's not health-related, you do have to pay taxes on that portion. But there are so many benefits to this account from a tax perspective, from a student loan perspective, and from a payment flexibility perspective, because high deductible health plans are typically the least costly of the health plans that you have available. And then lastly, with retirement accounts, again, I don't to go too deep into this. The two concepts I would want you to know are employee match. If your employer matches your contributions, you want to build yourself to the point where you leave no free money on the table. If they're matching 6% of your retirement contributions, you wanna be building towards as quickly as possible, putting that 6% in. Otherwise they're keeping their money and you're just leaving free money on the table. And then lastly, excuse me, when it comes to picking the investments inside of that 401k, thankfully over the years or that 403b or that 457, over the years, 401k plans have made that infinitely easier. And the way that they've made it easier is by offering what's called target date funds. Target date funds are funds that essentially prevent you from having to be an investment guru. And the way that they do that is you're going to see a plan in your retirement account that might say Vanguard Target Retirement 2050 or Fidelity Freedom Fund 2045. And the thing that's important to focus on is that year at the end, the 2045, the 2050, the 2055. And you match that up with the year that's closest to the age you want to retire. So if you want to retire and it would be the year 2053, you might find the fund 2055 
And the way it will work is the further you are from that date, the more aggressive your investments will be. And the closer you get to that retirement date, it will become, sounds odd to say progressively more conservative, but it will become more conservatively invested the closer you get to retirement. So it takes some of that mysticism out of retirement. It essentially says you can put it here and conceivably just leave it here. And as you get older, we're going to take care of adjusting the aggressiveness of this investment for you so you don't have to figure it out on your own. So I talked, I told you I was going to be done in five minutes. I think it took me seven. I do want to leave. I think we started like 707. So if we have five minutes for questions for people who want to stick around. Again, my name is Brenton Harrison. I appreciate you guys having me. I know I threw a lot at you, but I also want to make sure that you have an idea of how some of these tools build upon each other. And if you want to find me, ask me questions outside of this, uh, follow some of the things that we've done. Uh, in addition to being a financial advisor, which we obviously have a firm and clients for that. If you're just interested in general knowledge, we have a YouTube channel. If you just YouTube Brenton Harrison, I will give a disclaimer. Uh, this is very odd, but the, the New Zealand terrorist, uh, unfortunately, was also named Brenton Harrison. So you might have to Google Brenton Harrison financial advisor. But we have a YouTube channel. Uh, you can check out my website, brentonharrison.com. We have a blog there. And if you want to be on our email list, Every quarter or so, I send an extended email that might be relevant to some of the things that you're going through. You can email Ileana at seekhfg.com and she will put you on our email list. Uh, I hope this was beneficial to you guys and I'm gonna open it up for some questions. All right, so I see some, can you guys possibly read the questions to me? Uh, let me see, I see some in the chat. So one of the questions says, does the same thing apply to secured credit cards? Yes, uh, it does. Mm -hmm. that, so they're asking about the credit utilization in terms of when they um, check your credit utilization. It is the same principle. All right, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to see. I don't know if there's any more questions. I'm just trying to scroll up. Or if you uh, do, guys answer, are... do we answer about cashback cards? Oh, uh, that's right. Somebody asked about cashback cards. So cashback credit cards, for those who are unaware, um, a cashback card is a card where you make a transaction and you get like a flat rate of cash back as a reward which is very different than some credit cards who might say, instead of cash, we're gonna give you a reward point or travel miles back based on your purchases. Whereas a cashback card says, you know, if I spend a dollar, I'm gonna get 1% back in cash and I can use it. I love cashback cards. Uh, I have multiple credit cards, but my preference is a cashback card because the amount that you get as a reward is straightforward. What a lot of people are not aware of is a lot of those rewards cards, the value of a reward point is less than a penny. And you really want a reward point to be at least worth 1% of what you purchased. So I like cashback cards because you know exactly what you're getting. Whereas with a rewards point, you may be getting less than you realized. Um, let's see if I can make this chat larger. Because when somebody asks a question, it, how do you do? Uh, my pleasure on that. Uh, let's see. How do you factor in kids as an investment on that pyramid? Um, so kids as an investment, you might have to ex explain. Kids are not an investment. I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> um, not financially. Uh, what I would say is there are some things when you have children, even when you're pregnant with child, that can help lower your student loan payment. So for example, when it comes to federal student loans, I mentioned that they subtract the federal poverty level one and a half times the federal poverty level to determine your discretionary income. Something that not a lot of people are aware of is if your child is going to be born in the calendar year, you can actually count them as a family member before they're born. So you can lower your student loan payment the second that you have proof that you're pregnant, as long as your child will be born within that calendar year. So that would be one way to lower that required payment. 
when it comes to like just having kids and the daycare thing and the school thing, which I very much understand, um, it's, it is more so that is another reason to focus on building those other foundational items before you dip your toe in investing. Because if you do it the opposite way, now you're putting money at risk that you can't really afford to lose. And that's something that I get into all the time with people, you know, it's like, there's nothing more dangerous than somebody who's like following uh, very, very limited advice that they're receiving online and not applying it to their situation. So they're like, might see somebody who's talking about GameStop stock. They're like, oh, well, you know, I should put it in because people went up 50%, you know, uh, last week. I'm like, okay, but it went down 30% the week before and you are not in a position to lose 30%. So build the emergency fund, control the consumer debt, like make sure you have those things in place, especially with child, before you start trying to get too complex with the investments. Um, children do cost a lot, but it's the most expensive, hardest fund you'll ever have. Um, how do you determine the correct balance between paying loans and investing, paying the minimum on loans and invest the rest within budget or pay the monthly interest accrual and split the rest between loans and investing? What I would say is, Student loans got you to the point where you can make a high income. It's worthless if you don't save that high income. So that's a big reason why I'm such an advocate of making sure that your student loan payment fits within your ability to save and invest for yourself. Because what you will find if you try to be too aggressive paying down the debt is you'll be saying, oh, when I pay off this debt, I'll have so much more to invest, but it's gonna take you so long that by the time you get to that point, it's going to take just as much money to catch up for those lost years of investment. So in terms of finding a balance, saving for yourself is more important than paying off the student loans. And only when you can do both should you be really aggressive with student loans. Uh, Another question in the um, question box says, in your opinion, what is the best type of credit card to start off with in aims of building credit? Um, well, if you have student loans, you don't have to get a credit card to build credit because if you pay your student loans on time, again, that's the biggest part of your credit score that will take care of itself. So if that's the only reason that you're getting a credit card, that to me would not be a reason. But if you just need a credit card, I'm a big fan of cashback cards because um, again, it's straightforward in terms of the benefits you'll receive. I'm a big fan of cards that don't have an annual fee. I have cards that have an annual fee, but like if you're starting, you don't wanna be paying an annual fee for your credit card. Um, and if you are worried about your responsibility to pay it off in full, like I can't stress this enough, you do not need a credit card if you do not have the responsibility to pay it off in full before you pay any interest. If you're gonna have a credit card, you don't wanna be paying credit card interest. If you're worried about whether or not you have that responsibility, you can get, like somebody mentioned, a secured credit card where you actually have to put a deposit down to get the, the card. And you can only borrow either up to 100% or a lesser percent of what you put down as a deposit. Apart from investing, what are other ways to manage your extra savings without dumping it into your savings account? Um, depending on the amount you have above and beyond your savings, it could be investment real estate, it could be additional retirement contributions. Um, you know, there are a number of things. To me, the key principle is determining what that minimum amount is that you want to keep, or really maximum amount you want to keep in cash. And above that, making sure that you have a plan that is more, um, advantageous than just keeping it in cash. So part of that in terms of what are some extra ways to manage it might be determining what type of investor you wanna be. If you wanna be a real estate mogul, those extra savings could go towards purchasing your first investment property. But you also gotta understand if you're a landlord, like I've done rental properties, I don't have the temperament to be a landlord unless I have a property manager. So you might want to say, I want to do this, but I only want to do it when I can afford to have somebody manage the property for me, because I would just end up at, at odds with my tenant every time they called me because I just don't have the temperament. for it. Um, my fuse is 
a little shorter than it should be with stuff like that. Uh, let's see, let's see. Would you recommend income drip? Well, let me, let me ask you guys this because I'm just reading questions. I have time. I can stay here as long as people want to ask questions. Do you guys need to shut it down? Okay, I just want to make sure. All right, so would you recommend income-driven plans as opposed to other options since it lowers your discretionary income? What I would say, there is a fail-safe for certain income-driven plans. And that is, it's really for two income-driven plans. There are two income-driven plans that you cannot participate in those plans if it turns out that you could actually save money by just paying it off in 10 years. So for example, if it would take you $500 a month to pay your loans off in 10 years, but when you do the income driven plan, it's $700 a month, they actually they won't even let you participate. They'll just say, go to the 10 year plan. To me, that's a good fail safe to know whether income driven plans are right for you. If you get approved, then you're probably a good candidate for it because basically what they're saying is, you're not paying this off anytime soon unless you pay a tremendous amount of money. If you're on this plan, your payment's going to be lower than the 10 year plan. So I'm a fan of it just because of the flexibility to manipulate your payment in a legal way. Um, you know, if you owe six figures worth of debt, it's, it's just unlikely unless you're in like a dual income household that it would benefit you to not be on an income trip. probably already touched on, but would you say it's important to build up an emergency fund before getting to investments such as stocks and real estate? Yes. Um, don't put any money in the market that you can't afford to lose. That, that is my pr key principle. So if you can afford to lose it, that means you have an emergency fund. Until you're in that spot, I've even told people to stop contributing to their retirement accounts until they have at least a couple months expenses saved. Because again, like if, 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 a thousand or two thousand dollars or three thousand dollars as an emergency could pop up and just ruin your finances, then you're not really in a position to be doing those other things yet. And that's not a problem. Like if you don't put the cart before the horse and you build those savings first, it will actually free you up to be more aggressive when you start doing those things. Can you build debt faster with charge cards other than credit cards? A charge card is a credit card. Um, do you think it's best to consolidate student loans or not? That depends on the borrower. Um, there are people who, if they consolidate, it opens them up to have more options for student loans um, in terms of their repayment plan. And then there are other people where it really doesn't matter. Um, there are some benefits you can use in terms of getting credit towards repayment by consolidating your loans, that would kind of be a more complex answer for another presentation. It would be kind of getting in the weeds for this one. I think I, I, think I answered them all. I think. All right then. Well, this was definitely an amazing, oh, was there another question? Oh, okay. uh, last one, and then I'll. Okay. I, I see one that says, "What about the fire movement?" Um, fire is financial independence. Retire early. Uh, it is a very large movement, um, and I I think the best thing I can say about it is it depends on how extreme you want to be with fire, and this kind of gets into the line between the fact that I, I, I don't wanna get spiritual, so I'll just speak philosophically. Um, in my line of work, there are a lot of positive things that I see, right? Like, you know, but I also people see people who get disabled at 30 or die at 35. Um, you know, I had a family member last year who died and they had spent their entire career, you know, um, they're 63 years old, entire career talking about trips they were going to take with their wife once they retired, you know, and never taking those trips, always pushing it off into the future. Uh, and then they died and they never got to take those trips. 
and they surely aren't taking that money with them when they die. So I am on board with the concept of building towards financial independence as quickly as possible. I think that a lot of people in the FIRE movement can go to the extreme of not um, enjoying their money while they know they're here. And I think that you need to find that balance. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna be here 30 years from now. So to me, I'm going to save as if I will be, but I'm going on vacation and it's gonna be a nice vacation. And it's like, I'm not, like, there's just certain things where you have to find that balance. And I think that if there were more people in the fire movement who had the ability to see other people's finances other than their own, they would have more of that context. Um, but it's hard to tell someone, yeah, you, there's no guarantee that you get to live to enjoy this money. Uh, so I think you need to find that balance. And then I see, do you have any insight on Biden removing forgiven student loans? I think that it is highly likely that around, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if $10,000 got forgiven. I think it will likely be income-based. So you may not get the full 10,000 if you're making hundred, dollars $120,000 a year. Um, you probably have to be below a certain income threshold to get it, but I do think that they will eventually forgive some. They actually, without getting too deep in the weeds, have already made some adjustments into what happens when they wipe away student loan debt to make it not taxable. I think that a big reason that they did that was to clear the way if they ever decide to forgive student loans. But this stuff about like fifty thousand dollars that that ain't happening. Like I, you know, I could. If I'm wrong, you know, I'll buy you dinner, <laughs> but I don't think I'll be buying you dinner. <laughs> Gift card for dinner. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll hold you to that. All right, fair. <laughs> uh, well, let's see, is there any, I feel like we touched on all the questions here. Um, I am so proud of this webinar and thank you so much, <laughs> Mr. Harrison, for, for just, for one, volunteering your time and two, providing such great insight on all these questions that um, fourth year students as well as new practitioners need to know. A lot of the people that, are, that have listened in tonight have been practicing for less than five years and so with that being said, uh, we need, I'll speak on behalf of myself, I need a lot of financial guidance when it comes to these things. So I really hope that everyone found so much information, so much insight on all the gems that were dropped tonight. So thank you so much. My pleasure. And everyone have a great night. And if you have any questions, um, please make sure to um, contact Mr. Harrison on the um, slides that were just presented. Um, and if and we can also provide additional information. Please tell your friends to tell their friends that um, this will be recorded. So, yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. My we pleasure. really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. And a lot of the a lot of these concepts we have covered in videos. So I mean, welcome to reach out to me, but also I'd encourage you to subscribe because these are the types of stuff that we try to make sure we cover on a regular basis. Perfect. Thank you so, so, so much. And thank you all for coming as well. And thank you all for coming. The support is real and we really appreciate it. And also follow at NAFA New Practitioners on Instagram. Yes. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good night.